Hello, everyone. Glad to see everybody joining us. We're going to give uh, everyone just another minute to uh, file in here and make sure all the technology is working, and then we're going to get started. All right, welcome everybody. We're going to get started here. Our webinar today is the first in our series of CRM options for enterprise nonprofits. Really thrilled that everybody could join us. Hope everybody's technology is working and uh, we'll jump in. So uh, just a little bit about Heller Consulting. Uh, my name is Keith Heller and I'm the founder of the company. It started about 20 years ago. Uh, in the subsequent years, we've served over 1,500 nonprofit clients, uh, over 3,000 projects. Uh, we have offices located around the country, about 35 people on our team, and all of us have worked in nonprofits uh, working with the technologies uh, before uh, coming to work at Heller. And, uh, you know, part of why we do that is because we're just thrilled with the missions of the organization that we serve. So very, very happy uh, to be able to continue that uh, in our professional lives now as part of a consulting company. Um, some of what we do, uh, we help with CRM strategy and design. So uh, when people go to implement CRM technologies, uh, uh, fundraising, marketing, customer service technologies, uh, one of the first things you want to do is, uh, uh, as you would in building a house, hire an architect. So what's that big picture strategy? How are the different pieces going to fit together? Um, and then we actually do the implementation too. So using that house analogy, uh, you know, we're also the builders and contractors. So we can get in there and, and make the systems work. Uh, and then we do a lot around fundraising and engagement because uh, those are our roots. And we really understand uh, the value of that to nonprofits and the various strategies that people use to engage their constituents and, and fund their missions. Uh, some of our clients, uh, could, we couldn't put all 1,500 logos on one slide, so we, we had to be a little selective. Uh, but uh, these are just a, a small sampling of the many, many clients we've gotten to serve. And it's just such a thrill for us to support the, uh, so many worthy, worthy uh, missions. And uh, one of the things that we do at Heller is uh, uh, we think about a lot of stuff and then we write it down. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, being a, a boutique consulting firm, we're never going to serve all the nonprofits that we'd, we'd like to. Uh, and so what, part of what we try to do uh, is give back to the community by uh, uh, publishing our white papers and, and conducting webinar series like these to share what we've learned uh, with a broader audience, uh, many of whom we, we hope will work with us and many of whom we know for various reasons uh, we may not get to serve, and, but we nonetheless want to pass along the collective knowledge that we've accumulated uh, uh, between us and our clients. So we encourage you to go to the Team Heller website, uh, look at the resources. This is just a sampling here. And actually, if in the Go to Webinar uh, toolbar, there's a section for handouts, and there you'll find uh, five of our most popular papers uh, available that you could download right now. Um, when, of course, you're not listening to me. Uh, but uh, please, uh, please do avail yourselves of those. Uh, we really are, uh, really are very happy to get those out there and hope you'll enjoy them. So this, today's webinar is the first in a seven-part series. Um, I'll be speaking today about uh, kind of some best practices, tips around evaluating CRM systems and choosing, uh, choosing one for yourselves. Uh, and then the subsequent uh, sessions uh, six sessions, one each for each of the uh, vendors and products you see listed below. Salesforce.org nonprofit success pack. Uh, that webinar will be coming up on Tuesday, June 27th, uh, and you'll get getting announcements soon around that. So, uh, but please note that date and calendars. Uh, then followed by Blackboard, uh, NGO Connect, another Salesforce-based product, a Clearview, Stratus Live, showing us uh, what they've done with MS Dynamics, Microsoft Dynamics and then Roy Solutions. So, so six of the most prominent, prevalent uh, fundraising and CRM systems uh, in the nonprofit sector. And uh, really thrilled, uh, want to thank in advance all of the vendors for uh, their willingness to participate uh, in the series. So what is the series? It's a, it's a broad uh introduction to the systems that are most often uh, considered by uh, large nonprofits. 
Um, we wanted to provide a single experience uh, and place to go. Uh, if you wanted to just get a, a touch, a taste of what uh, you should consider if you're going to adopt a new uh, fundraising solution uh, or you're looking at CRM, and we'll talk about the difference between those two things later, uh, where you can just get a sense of, of what we think you should look at and what your peers are looking at. Um, and we wanted to offer this so that you uh, could get that quick sampling um, in a discreet way without having to kind of, uh, you know, start contacting vendors and get into a process uh, when maybe you're, you know, you just want to kind of poke around a little bit. And also where uh, you could um, see all the major piece players in one spot. Now, what I do, the caveat uh, that I, I, I want to put in here is that this series will not be enough for you to make a choice. Uh, I would feel terrible if if someone simply looked at this series when it's complete and then chose software based on that. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into making these considerations and we're going to cover that uh, today. But what we do hope you'll learn is uh, just some a, a baseline sense of the options that are out there for you uh, so that you can then move forward in, in a more uh, uh, concentrated uh, approach uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like today and then in our next steps. So hopefully this uh, feels like uh, you're in the right place today. So I've said, uh, we said uh, this is about enterprise nonprofits. So what do we mean by that? Um, some non uh, nonprofits you can identify easily as enterprise simply by their scale. Very large organizations, let's say those with annual budgets of 100 million and up or 50 million and up. Um, are immediately going to fit into that uh, category. Just the complexity of the operation that they're running is, uh, by their very nature, going to uh, make them uh, enterprise organizations. Um, other uh, nonprofits that may not uh, be that scale in terms of dollars uh, may think in a very broad and sophisticated way about the visions that they have for their CRM systems. Um, I would uh, encourage you to look back at some of the webinar series and papers that we've written uh, in the past around CRM and what we mean by CRM vision and such I'm going to touch on a little bit today but in a nutshell CRM vision doesn't just mean uh, we like fancy cool technology um, it is also uh, that technology in the service of delivering uh, the an optimal experience to your constituents and how they get to engage with your organization and how they feel treated by you and you're capable of, of treating them in a very holistic way, uh, in, a, in an unsiloed way across your organization. Uh, and, and I think all of us who uh, you know, have worked in nonprofits for a while know that it's not easy to have uh, to operate in an unsiloed manner because our technology systems and our, and our businesses are organized in a way uh, into these silos of different departments. Uh, and we don't always see it, but in fact our constituents often do because they're getting multiple mailings and emails and communications um, that show that the left hand and right hand don't really know what they're doing. So a robust or sophisticated CRM vision in our perspective means one that helps to eliminate those uh, silos so the constituent feels treated as a, as a whole person. So that's CRM vision in a nutshell. Um, your selection process for enterprise nonprofits will differ from uh, uh, you know other nonprofits in, in a few ways. One is that it's almost certain, uh, in spite of all marketing you may be, you may be uh, subjected to, you will end up with multiple applications in your environment. You will not end up with a single product or a single platform or even a single vendor who's going to do everything for you. It's simply, it's, it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of a uh, nirvana, promised land uh, vision out there that, that uh, vendors want to present to you that I wish was true, uh, but in fact, any sophisticated nonprofit is going to have to, in order to um, meet best practices in different departments with different business functions and different goals with your constituents, is going to have to consume tools uh, from different vendors and different platforms. Uh, and so you have to just kind of prepare yourself for that uh, reality, uh, plan for it proactively rather than having it happen haphazardly is often the case for, for most of us. Um, Embrace it and, and see, okay, if that's the truth, how do we move forward in a really uh, positive manner to adopt a multi-application environment intentionally and make it work for ourselves? 
very likely uh, the business intelligence is going to be part of that. That uh, the native reporting tools in any one application are not going to be sufficient, uh, perhaps within the application itself, to give you the kinds of reports that you need to run your organization. And certainly those re uh, reporting tools in any one application won't be enough to bring together key pieces of data uh, across multiple applications. So you may look to a, a business intelligence tool, a reporting layer, uh, which may or may not include a data warehouse, to help aggregate information that's going to help you make strategic decisions. Um, your vendor relationships are going to be key. Of course, for, for everyone, uh, they want their vendor to be engaged with them and, and uh, really take care of them, not just uh, offer them the product and the maintenance. Um, but when you're an enterprise organization, you're trying to be more sophisticated about the tools that you have, and you're going to rely on the vendors to help you do that. Now, uh, the nice thing is, uh, in the inverse, uh, because of your scale or your vision or your aspirations, um, it could range anywhere from the money that you spend with a vendor to your willingness to be a case study and a spokesperson, um, they are very keyed into you. Uh, and so developing that relationship is important. Um, change management is a huge piece when you go to uh, implement CRM at an enterprise nonprofit because uh, it's going to involve a lot of people across your organization. And uh, ideally, this is not simply a project to adopt new technology. It's a project to drive and support and drive key strategies at your organization. So, so it's, it's not something that's happening in the background of the organization. It's actually part of the foreground in shifting uh, the impact that you have in your organization, either the funds that you raise, the, the way that you're engaging your constituents, or the way that you're serving your constituents, perhaps all of these things. And this is, a, this is an organization-wide process that requires everybody to sort of buy in and be on board. And finally, that kind of plays into, uh, ideally, again, it's not a technology project, it's a strategic project, uh, or it's a project to support your strategies, uh, and that that line between your strategic plan and what you're doing with the technology is quite clear to people. So let's, um, let's start to look at the, the, the big picture here. Big picture in general and the big picture for, uh, for your organization. So looking broadly at market trends, uh, so it's quite the common story that uh, the technology people are on today, they have been on for five or 10 or 15 years or more sometimes. Um, certainly in uh, many people in their core systems and systems that uh, are used to either serve their constituents or to uh, support them through, let's say, traditional uh, fundraising and communication channels like uh, direct mail, uh, systems are very old uh, and can, kind of getting a little, a little rickety sometimes. The good news is the contemporary choices are really good. There's a lot of really, really good systems out here. Uh, you're going to get to see those with the vendors that we've invited to um, participate. We've invited these vendors, not merely because uh, they're popular but uh, and, and often show up in an RFP process and such, um, but because uh, uh, they are uh, popular uh, for a reason, and that is because they are working to stay at the front side of, of uh, what they ha can offer their, their, their customers. Um, the other, the other trend that we're seeing is that there is the emergence of true CRM platforms. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, and also powerful uh, business intelligence and analytics tools. And I want to make a note that all of the, the, the many of the advances uh, that are being made in, in nonprofit technology are uh, also a result of the advances that are being made in commercial technology, te technology uh, you know, available to the Fortune 500 and such. And that uh, vendors, um, nonprofit vendors, uh, to some degree, are sometimes translating the uh, uh, accelerated uh, use of technologies for, for customer engagement and translating that into what those tools could do for us and nonprofits for constituent engagement. Um, and when it look, comes to uh, the business intelligence analytics tools and methodologies and such, those things are rolling straight out of the commercial sector. Why is that important? Because uh, the commercial sector has a tremendous amount of money to spend on improving these technologies and paying their software vendors uh, who 
can sometimes turn out to be our software vendors, uh, either directly or indirectly, paying them so that their R&D budget can be uh, quite substantial. Um, and in the end, uh, this trickles down to us, uh, and it's very helpful in that way. And then the last thing that's happening uh, in market trends is that uh, these new technologies and, uh, you know, are, are not as new as they used to be. So uh, five, four or five years ago, uh, you would have been a more on the cutting edge to consider either some of the uh, vendors and products that you'll see uh, in the series or some of the features that, uh, that, that the vendors uh, may choose to show you uh, either in the series as part of direct engagement with you in a, in a production cycle. Um, but uh, what used to be brand new and, and a little risky has now become more tried and true and tested by your peers. So it's, it's a great time to be out there and choosing new technology because of all of these things. So how about the big picture of your organization? So these are uh, things that you want to start to think about and articulate to yourself. The first piece is why are you getting a new system? Why are you out shopping for something else? Um, are you simply replacing technologies? Are you trying to become more efficient? Are you trying to get more access to information? Those, those three are good reasons, but they're not usually uh, inspiring enough to help you get through what is always a, uh, a challenging project at different times to swap out technologies. Um, it's not like changing your printer. Uh, you know, there's a lot that goes into these kinds of projects. And it takes, uh, your purpose has to be a bit more than simply, well, we don't like what we have or it's it's you know not doing as well as we'd like, or we'd like to you know do a little things in the back office a little bit faster. None of those things really calc out to being enough to change systems. But the last uh, the, these last ones breaking down silos that can be pretty compelling. Collaborating within and across departments, you know, breaking breaking down again any barriers. Why are those things start to be uh, worthwhile or start to be enough? If you tie them to the next bullet, supporting larger strategies, what I encourage every, uh, every one of our selection clients to do is pull out your strategic work board, sit down, and let's see where in, e in each of your strategic goals, how could technology, uh, let's, could technology help drive that strategic goal and make it possible? Um, and if so, how? And let's start to articulate that, right? And, and as you articulate how, your uh, technology choices could support your strategies, you're starting to develop your, um, uh, uh, your, your list of what you need your systems to do and what those priorities might be, right? Because you want to support your, your top strategic uh, uh, goals before, before your further ones. So that whole process of, of not just picking technology in a silo, but to actually sit down with your strategic report and start to map it out is really important. Um, now you want to be, uh, as you look at your systems, uh, you want to be looking at the future, not at the past. So what are, not what strategies have been key for you in the past, but which ones are today and, and you think, what, what are your, our strategies going to be moving forward? Same with your business processes. Now, business processes change a lot when you change systems. They should change. Most, most organizations' business strategies or business processes are based on uh, or were developed because that's what the systems they have allowed them to do. So you want to be moving forward with that. And finally, working together, uh, uh, whether you've done it before in the past or not, within departments and across departments, you should assume that it is key to your success in the future. Um, nonprofits, uh, in order to best serve the constituents and give them the best experience, are going to have to, uh, if they haven't already needed to, really become collaborative organizations internally. And finally, uh, you know, based on that market trend I noted at the beginning, you have to go in with the assumption, uh, and no one likes to say this, but your technology might need to serve you for 15 years. Um, most, most people like to say they're doing, they're going to select technology for three to five years and will begrudgingly accept, accept that it might be five or 10. But if you look at your organization's history, of moving uh, through technologies, uh, unless you've been significantly more aggressive than every 12 or 15 years, you might want to assume that the past is, 
a predictive somewhat of the future. Another way to be, another place to be self-reflective is the culture of your organization relative to technology. So um, when we go shopping for technology in nonprofits, uh, sometimes, quite often there are some people who are very excited about all of this and some who have trepidation at the organization. And um, those who uh, are excited about technology are often the people who get to be part of the selection process because they're excited about it. But it's not enough that uh, just those people who are part of the selection process are excited uh, or embrace technology. You have to look at the culture of the organization as a whole because in the end, it's, all, it's about adoption by the end users. And if you have a culture that is um, uh, you know, very concerned about change uh, and particularly change around technology, it's important to admit that up front. There's not a judgment about it. It's not better or worse than other organizations, uh, but it will inform the cho choices that you make and the success in implementing those choices. If you have an organization that has shown itself historically to um, be at the front of the pack when it comes to new technologies, kind of leading your peers or up, the, up, up there in that front part of the, front part of the peer group, um, then choosing uh, newer technologies now uh, won't diverge so much from the past and, and you can expect uh, a greater, uh, uh, you know, greater odds of success and, and full adoption of those, of those new shiny tools. If your organization has shown uh, a lot of resistance or difficulty in moving to new technologies in the past, well, you might want to, uh, you know, when you look at your options, uh, consider something that's a little more conservative in that, in that way. Um, and it's uh, because an organization can only uh, adopt what the culture will allow it to adopt. Um, so these are important things to look at. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about uh, products versus platforms. Uh, this is an important distinction. Okay, so um, when we talk about fundraising systems, uh, that is looking at the constituent from a particular, uh, uh, particular lens. Uh, so um, your engagement strategy with a donor is focused around um, getting them to, uh, you know, uh, increase uh, the frequency or amount or both of their financial contributions to your organization. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, but, of course, that constituent is engaged with you in other ways, potentially, at your organization. Uh, they might also be, let's say, an advocate for your organization. Uh, they might advocate uh, in, a, in a political sense, uh, or they might be someone who you enlist, uh, either informally or formally, to spread the word about your organization. Um, and th so then, when you're engaging with them from those perspectives, uh, that's, uh, you want a different outcome of your engagement with them, and uh, therefore you need uh, tools that allow you to connect with them in a different way. Uh, they might be a beneficiary of your organization's mission. Uh, and so, uh, again, there, you're trying to support their life in some way uh, based on your mission. And so the messaging that you have to them and the way that you interact with them and you give them the, the opportunity to interact with you is going to be different from uh, if it's in fundraising. Now, right now, uh, this is probably happening at your organization already, uh, and a specific person will be touched by, your, by multiple departments in your organization. Uh, and those departments are each using a different system. And what happens is uh, uh, quite often uh, through you know, no, no bad intent, but uh, there are little fiefdoms that get set up and everybody kind of feels like they own their constituent, they own that, their relationship with their constituents, not recognizing that their constituents are, in fact, some of them are constituents to everybody in the organization. And when each department is doing its own thing with that person, they don't know <laughs> how that person is actually getting impacted by the organization. The only person who knows is the person themselves. And again, going back to what I said earlier, they kind of feel like, oh, geez, the left hand and the right hand don't know what they're doing here. Uh, are they spending my money wisely? Are they giving me the best advice? Are they, there's, there's some, uh, a little bit of sense of doubt that starts to creep in, and, and unfortunately, that can erode their, their confidence. Um, how, do we, how do we make sure that that, 
confidence, not only do we not erode confidence, but we really give people a really uh, uh, more high-touch, individualized experience. Well, we can bring those different departments and different uh, business functions into the same uh, product or suite of products that are interconnected. Um, and that interconnected suite of products is what we call a platform. And that platform is usually uh, supported by uh, a single vendor that then uh, you know, offers a place where you can have you know, fundraising and marketing and mission all, all located in one spot. Uh, so you know, there are pros and cons to both, to having a platform and to having a fundraising system. Uh, but I wanted to kind of hopefully make a distinction there that's useful. So I talked about the difference. Um, many vendors uh, claim they have CRM systems. Uh, CRM has become a really popular word. Um, and the uh, import of it, uh, the general idea of it is, gosh, there's a place I can put everybody in my, in my organization, every constituent, every type of piece of data into that system. And so every vendor sort of raises their hand. Uh, and this is not even to every vendor, those who are on, uh, you know, part of this, of this uh, series, those who are not uh, in the commercial sector everywhere, they all say, oh, yeah, we have a CRM system. And, but, but when you ask them, what does CRM mean to you, they usually talk about it based on exactly what their product did and what they would have said to you two years ago anyway. You know, we, pull, we provide a 360-degree view of, and then they'll name their specific niche. Well, once they name a niche, that's not CRM anymore. You know, it's, it's become too narrow. So this is not to say that, that uh, though they're not offering a great product for you, but that you want to be wary of that word CRM because it can get used uh, a little uh, uh, loosely. Um, why does it matter to you a product versus a platform? Well, you want to come back to your CRM vision. How do you want your constituents to feel engaged with your organization? And how important is it to you to get that uh, full view of how they're engaged with you before you communicate with them or as you communicate and engage with them? And if that's really, you know, very, very important to you, then you'll want to look at a platform. If, uh, if it's less important to you or you're willing to go about that same process in another way, you can start to look at a product. Um, if you're going to look at a product, you, but you still want to achieve that goal of that broader view based on you know, their engagement with other parts of your, of your organization, then you're probably going to become more reliant on business intelligence tools. Now, that's not a bad thing, but it does require a certain level of investment at your organization to have those tools and to have the expertise. So a true platform will lessen the amount of work you have to do to bring that bring actionable information together. Um, now, a platform will require you to um, make sure all the pieces are working and working well together. And this is true whether that whether you put together a platform from a single vendor, um, or if you go out and sort of uh, pull best of breed systems together to, and, and make them work, because even platforms from single vendors. Uh, or suite product suites uh, don't necessarily work smoothly together. Um, so you want to be careful about those words. Everything is going to be smooth, easy, easy, seamless, integrated. Um, this is where we say, uh, I think I say it later. You know, trust but verify. Uh, really dig into if those if those uh, connections between different parts of a platform, different applications from the same vendor, are important to you uh, and key to your strategies. You really want to dig into how those work, uh, because when when any vendor says integration, uh, you don't really know what they mean. Um, you know, does that mean they integrate? We integrate first name and last name, or is there are there 200 fields that integrate, and there are 200 that I care about? And how how smoothly does that go? Um, so these are things that you want to start to unpack as you talk to the vendors, and 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 we'll talk a little later about um, you know references and such also. So I did allude uh, just a minute ago to the uh, import of uh, business intelligence tools. These are becoming increasingly uh, prevalent in the nonprofit sector. Uh, you know, they are basically a reporting tool. I'm going to really make it very simple, but reporting applications that pull data uh, 
from multiple applications and or from a data warehouse. Sometimes you, you push data from your multiple applications into a data warehouse and then attach the BI tool to that. Sometimes the BI tool reaches directly into the applications themselves and pulls the data, but really it's a reporting tool that spans data sets. Um, and these tools have gotten a lot better over the last several years. Again, the commercial sector has been you know, screaming for these and investing, and so these, there's a lot of vendors out there. Uh, they're not nonprofit specific, but they don't need to be. Um, and these vendors have really figured out a lot about how to uh, pull data into their, into their reporting tools, how to massage that data, how to display that data in really cool graphs and charts that makes it simpler to understand the, the, the valuable information they're providing you. Uh, they're easier to use. Um, and so uh, this is an area where you want to really consider now that a BI tool is, is not a, uh, I'm going to say it's not a necessary evil because your systems don't do what you want them to do. It's actually a really good tool for you to have in your tool belt. Um, and you'll, you'll want to have business intelligence tools. And, and, and as you, if you accept that and start to look into what they can do, it will shift uh, your emphasis uh, as you select your CRM system about how important certain integrations and such are. Because some integration needs uh, uh, become less if you have the correct business intelligence tools. And frankly, integration is never easy. So uh, if you can lessen your reliance on it, uh, you're in a good spot. Um, and it will, it will uh, this question down here, do I really need to centralize my data? Less so if you have the proper BI tools. And I think that's the direction that the market is headed. And you'll see large software vendors, if you, if you follow the uh, uh, almost Game of Thrones trials and tribulations of Salesforce.com and Oracle and Microsoft and SAP, these huge companies serving the Fortune 100 and 500, what you'll start to see is that they are really building out their business intelligence and data analytics and our artificial intelligence, all of these things, so that um, data centralization becomes less important to them and their clients, and they have to do this because they're, the amount of data that is available to them now is so huge that they can't spend all that time moving things back and forth and back and forth. Um, and so they develop these tools, and now we have access to these tools. Okay, um, is there a benefit to a single vendor uh, for enterprise NGOs? Um, I would argue uh, it is of limited benefit. Um, that uh, in the end, for enterprise nonprofits, you are going to have to live with and thrive with uh, multiple applications from multiple vendors. Um, it is uh, almost certainly the environment you live with now, and uh, it'll be, I think, for most, it'll be the environment you live with moving forward for two reasons. One is because um, uh, you can't switch everything you've got now onto a single vendor. There's simply too many, too many moving pieces, too many systems, too many departments that would all have to move at once. Uh, and so even if you could envision a future where there was a single vendor, uh, it would take you a long time to get there. Um, and uh, the second is that I don't think you would want to get there, um, simply because if uh, across an enterprise organization, there's half a dozen or a dozen or two dozen business functions that you're trying to achieve, uh, different constituencies you're trying to engage with, and uh, it's unlikely that any one vendor is going to be able to do that in the most effective way across all the things that you're trying to do in your organization. Um, and so uh, uh, what I suggest is you, you don't start with the premise that that is what you're aiming for, but that you get acclimated to the idea that we are going to have these multiple systems and multiple vendors. The other piece is that, uh, uh, you know, even vendors own products, uh, you know, within, the, within the, the vendor's products themselves or within their network of uh, uh, partners who build applications for them, um, not everything's always integrated uh, and integrated in the sense that we, we, we all wish they were. Integration is a tricky word. When you, when you say, uh, hey, these two systems are integrated, what happens to most people is they imagine this big red button. Uh, and that when they push the big red button, everything they want from system A goes into system B. Everything they want from system B goes into system A. And it takes as much time as downloading my email to my iPhone. 
and it's just beautiful and gorgeous and works perfectly. And that's almost never the case, uh, and that's not the fault of the vendors. It's just really integration is tough. Um, but uh, in many cases, you're, if you even if you get from a single vendor, integrations are not going to be exactly what you hoped or wish they were. So it's important to, to look at those. If you were to select a single vendor or set of tools, um, and that was your driving priority as you went into selection, um, you may find that a, a single vendor can offer you directly or through their partners things that cover most of your business needs. But what you'll often find in that environment is they cover them in very specific ways that they are very comfortable doing or that fit you know, their model of how they believe things should be done or the model of the first few clients they had on those products who helped develop those products with them. Um, but that might not fit how you do things now or it might not uh, give you the flexibility to change and adapt what you do over time. Um, and so you'll, you'll end up compromising. Now, uh, you know, of course, the temptation and the value of having things from a single vendor is that uh, it would appear to be less effort to uh, manage those systems. And sometimes that's true. Um, uh, if, but then it often, for an enterprise nonprofit, ends up with also compromising uh, uh, on what kinds of things that you can do with your system. So there's a real tricky balance there that you have to look at. This doesn't come up for smaller nonprofits. They simply don't have the internal bandwidth to, to manage a more sophisticated CRM environment. So, so for them, you know, and, and if you have peers who are uh, among those smaller nonprofits, they would be advised to go to a single vendor because it'll be easier for them to manage. But quite often their strategies are not as sophisticated or complex. Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, key parts of the selection process itself. So this is not going to be exhaustive. Um, uh, what I wanted to do here was to just, uh, you know, I sat down with our consulting team and we looked at, you know, what the full selection process looks like and we just pulled out certain areas where we thought um, that are, are usually uh, the trickiest for people or where we thought a little bit of our perspective would be maybe, uh, you know, most, most helpful. So the first thing is, first thing, when you go into the selection process, your first question should not be, okay, what are we going to look at? What systems are we going to look at? What vendors are we going to call? Uh, instead, uh, you want to get started with, um, with following some of these guidelines. You know, uh, how are we going to secure buy-in within our organization? Who's going to participate? Uh, but how are we going to get the right level of participation? Because we want some participation, but also, you don't pick, uh, this is not a, uh, uh, you know, uh, a consent, a unanimous consent kind of project. Uh, you know, you have to have the right people with the right levels of authority weighing in on what systems, uh, how the system selection is going to go. What are your priorities, right? Uh, what are the, what are the uh, opportunities the systems are going to help you capitalize on? What are the problems they're going to help you uh, resolve? Uh, start to list those out and prioritize them. Are we going to uh, the full CRM, uh, the full platform, as I've described? Or, uh, in this case, do we need just fundraising and communications? Um, I would argue there's not, there's not an overarching right answer, um, especially with the introduction of business intelligence tools. Um, but I would argue there's probably a right answer for your organization. And so sitting down and thinking through that is, is important. Um, change management, I'm going to say a little bit about this later, but, but you want to start this early. You really, from the get-go, you have to start helping people understand what this project is about, that it's not fundamentally a technology project, but it's part of the strategic effort to move your organization forward, to articulate what that exactly means to them, what it's going to mean to your constituents, how it's going to help you serve more people, uh, raise more money, uh, get more of your mission delivered um, and what their role is going to be in it. You know, there's going to be some parts of it they're really excited about. There's going to be some parts uh, they have trepidations about. But start those conversations uh, early on. Um, and then uh, we advocate or suggest a lean selection process. Um, sometimes the selection process can get 
somewhat overwrought. And you have to be uh, careful about burning people out on your team. So uh, recognize that uh, it is important, uh, and we in our own consulting, selection consulting, use you know metrics and uh, uh, you know scorecards and things. But in the end, uh, choosing your technology is uh, not strictly math. Right? You don't just add up all the points and say, okay, that one with the most points won. Uh, there's going to be more. There's also going to be a level of subjectivity in it. So uh, that's where the art comes in a little bit. You're going to want to uh, assign the right people to the right topics. We'll talk about roles in a minute here. And it's important in selection to keep momentum going. Uh, one of the things that can be quite difficult when you get into the actual implementation of the products, which is a much larger effort, is if you've spent so much time in selection and have, it's been so exhaustive that everyone's exhausted they've lost the excitement and motivation and energy and patience to do what's actually the hardest part, which is the implementation. So keeping it lean where you can, uh, I think, is a very good idea. All right, setting expectations. I've said this, I think, eight times now. <laughs> the strategic project. It's not a technology project. How are we going to advance our goals? How are we going to go over our constituents a better experience? Um, uh, this is part of the change management process, right? right? As you're talking to someone about, hey, we're going to go adopt new CR, or we're going to get a new fundraising system, we're going to ask you to do A and B and C. We're going to ask you to help us understand your role, help us understand what you need of the system. Um, uh, we need you to participate in those conversations. We need you to participate in testing, uh, uh, you know, whatever that list may look like. Your job is going to change. Like what you do day to day, may change because obviously how you interact with the, the systems is going to change because it's a new system. But also your business pro our business processes are going to change. Our goal with new technology is not to make this cool new technology do what our old systems did. You know, that's great. We're getting these flexible new systems. They're so flexible we make them look and act just like the thing we just had for 10 years. That's not the goal. You know, so you have to set up front the idea, yeah, your job's going to change. Now we're going to support you with training. We're going to support you through this process, um, but we're also going to expect that you're going to change how you do your day-to-day -day work. Um, and then uh, the benefit to the organization is going to be A, B, C. You want to really be clear that this is what, uh, this is why we're doing this change because we know it's going to help our organization be more successful. And those messages have to come right from the top. They really need to come from the executive leadership, ideally from from the CEO and the chairman of the board. Um, and then this is what our process is going to be in this Camera timeline. And these things that you talk about, you're going to talk about all through the project here, through selection, through implementation, through post go live. You're just going to keep talking about these things over and over and over again because it's going to remind people, you're always trying to remind people what the big picture is and why we're doing this. So for roles, um, you got to have you want to have the right people working on the right things. So um, involving uh, the key stakeholders and business owners. Uh, when it's a technology selection process, sometimes people think, well, we'll have the technology. Those who are most comfortable and enjoy technology the most, they'll take the lead. Well, then you'll probably get something that, from a technology perspective, is really really cool, but it might not meet the end needs of the business owners. And there we're talking about, you know, the the heads of departments who uh, set you know, set the goals and the, and the tactics uh, for each department and need, need things done and need reports back and information back on how those things uh, have fared. Um, so those business owners, whether they like technology or not, they have to be involved in the process. Uh, the primary end users, of course, have to be involved. Um, and then the different business needs uh, for each department should be uh, ideally evaluated both by people within the department who know those things already, and then someone from the outside of that department who can be objective and ask questions. Because sometimes what will happen is someone will say, well, I need the system to do A, B, and C. And uh, the, the outside person will go, well, that's interesting. I understand A and B, but why C? Well, C is because we've always done it that way. Well, do you have to keep doing it that way? Do you need to, you know, someone who can help. Uh, we all get embedded in what we're used to doing. And so we need someone 
with an outside perspective, uh, whether that's a consultant, and I'll talk about that later, uh, or or just someone else within our own organization uh, who brings something different to it, to to take a look and say, oh, interesting. You know, can can we start to think about things differently because it's going to be a new system? With the actual project of selecting software, um, you do want to have uh, someone or ones. Uh, who are going to represent the project with the vendors and other providers, kind of the external folks to the organization. Um, and that's not to say you want to be strict, strict gatekeepers. Uh, that does not tend to, to uh, uh, help the vendor understand you, uh, nor does it help you understand the vendors. Uh, sometimes people will um, have a very rigid procurement process. Uh, and thinking that this uh, brings a certain level of objectivity to the process, but in fact, what we see uh, is that it kind of warps uh, everybody, the client's perception of the vendors and what they offer, and the vendor's perception of what the client needs. So it's very important that uh, software vendors get to talk to the end users directly. Now, there could that could be in a in a form of some sort that you organize, but you want to be careful not to. to, to cut off uh, too much uh, your vendors from contact. Uh, you can give them guidelines, but that's what, uh, you know, that's why selecting the right people to represent the project uh, externally is very important. And, and what we find works most often is if those representatives um, are coming from the business department that are going to ultimately use the product. And then who's going to represent and drive the project internally? That's um, you know, who's going to project manage and make sure everything's flowing along, and then also be communicating with, uh, with internal staff about where we are in the project and what's going to happen next, and, and uh, kind of uh, both a, kind of a little bit of PR for the project as it goes along, so people feel engaged, excited, included. Who's going to represent and support the system over the long term? This is very important. At the, at the very outset, uh, you know, often what will happen is, if you're, you know, you, you have existing systems now and someone is either formally or informally in charge of making sure those, things, those systems work. We have to think ahead, okay, in X months uh, when this project's, uh, when we've actually implemented our new sol uh, solutions, who's going to be in charge of it? Whoever, whoever you identify, even if it's a tentative decision at this point, you want them involved in the selection project at the very beginning uh, because Along the way, you're going to have a lot of discussions about what we need the system to do and what we don't and what our priorities are. And some of it's going to get written down and some of it's not. And you're going to you know, have conversations with vendors. They're going to lead you towards one vendor and away from another. And it's going to be uh, really important that the person who's in charge of the system over the longer term has been there for those conversations uh, because not everything does get reported or transmitted to them. And yet it's, uh, it's going to be important for them to understand all that. So uh, having that context starts by engaging them early. And finally, uh, certainly very, very important is executive sponsorship. We need at the highest level of the organization uh, executives who will say, this is a really important project. It's a priority for us. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take effort. It's going to take change. Uh, but we all need to do it um, and be a cheerleader and a supporter for the project. Okay, so when you start to look at the functionality, one of the first pieces you look at is, um, and this is what almost everybody does, is, is they start to look at systems, they go, oh my gosh, look at that. This system does X, Y, and Z, and our current system doesn't do that. That's so cool. I really want that. And so that's great, and it's really important to make note of those. It's, it, it, you know, it starts to get you excited, and uh, uh, you start to open up your mind to how you're going to be able to do your jobs better, and and raise more money and engage with more constituents, deliver more mission. This is that's fantastic. So start writing those down and noting, you know, how important those are. Um, there are features that are new for the market as a whole, new to the nonprofit sector. Well, you want to um, make note of those and uh, ask yourself, okay, are these important to me, and how might I use these? Um, so, uh, but new to the market doesn't mean they're going to stick around uh, and be successful. So, you know, some, some uh, tools become available 
and they get a lot of buzz uh, or some features and they get a lot of buzz uh, and then you know a year later well uh, a bunch of nonprofits tried it and it didn't really work out so the fact that they're uh, available to you you might not rank them as highly as those things that are new to you that you know you're going to use uh, but it is interesting and it does show uh, creativity and forward thinking on the part of the vendor so it's something to, to keep in mind um, uh, future proof systems what I mean here is that because you're going to be buying your system for at least and holding on to it for at least a decade you want to be aware of where the flexibility is in the solution that you pick um, if you have too little flexibility in areas that are evolving uh, in how we engage with our constituents, then you're going to be in a little bit of a in trouble. You know, we don't know. I don't know, certainly, uh, how what the new communication channels are going to be in five years. Um, I have a pretty good sense it's not going to go through the U.S. Postal Service. So, if if you're looking at the the tool uh, and and you say, well, the direct mail piece works great here, but gosh, it doesn't look like it's going to give me a lot of flexibility over time. Well, I, I don't know that I would worry too much about that. But if you look at the online pieces, uh, email and social and, and web, and you said, gosh, they look great for today, but I don't know if they're going to change or evolve, well, that would, be, that would be a little bit of a red flag for me. So you have to see, you want to look for the places where there's going to be a growth um, moving forward. And finally, this is a piece almost everybody forgets about. We get distracted by the shiny objects of what's new, new for the software, new for the industry, new to my organization, and we don't look at what is working really well right now in my organization uh, with my current systems because we can come in with the assumption that what works well now, of course it's going to work in the new system. Doesn't every, doesn't every CRM system do A, B, and C? I just assumed it did because mine does now. Well, you have to be very careful about those assumptions. Um, this can be particularly true in some of the uh, less exciting aspects of what our CRM systems do for us. Um, and, and one aspect, certainly if, if it's talking about fundraising, is in uh, revenue management and gift processing and gift acknowledgement and reconciliation with accounting. These are very, very important pieces and they're very, very dull. Um, and I say that even though I started my career and have spent much of my career focused around those issues, we, you know, we have to admit it's not as exciting as, you know, an integration with a Facebook or Snapchat or, you know, text, to, you know, mobile text uh, to give. And those are really kind of cool, sexy new things. But uh, uh, you have to make sure that the blocking and tackling basics are there also. So don't forget to look for those pieces. So then um, you, you want to start to get put together a catalog of your business needs have to be careful um, you know uh, uh, you can start to make lists that are immensely long uh, and they're overwhelming uh, to uh, to your team and they're overwhelming to the vendors um, and in the end uh, when you get lists that long the important stuff can get lost um, so uh, and sometimes the vendors responses they're trying to check as many boxes as they can no no offense to, to the good people working at, at uh, you know at software vendors, but their job is to check as many boxes as possible. So um, what's important is uh, as you catalog your business needs, as you prioritize, and you focus on those things that are, are are really important for your organization. And you don't have to start these lists from scratch. You can Google on the internet. You can go to peers who are going through this process. You don't have to start from scratch, nor should you. Um, and then uh, you want to assign uh, areas to different stakeholders and staff to prioritize, evaluate, test, and score. And, and when I say to different stakeholders, um, ultimately you don't need everybody evaluating every, everyone who's part of the selection process does not have to evaluate every part of the solutions. If you ask people to be that involved, you will risk burnout. Because at a certain point when you're looking at three or four systems, uh, and that's as many as I would suggest, um, you know, you want to go deep in certain areas, and then you're asked, if you're asking everybody to go deep in every area, you're going to lose people, uh, and it's and it's it's going to be tough on them. Um, 
Now, if you're, again, if you're looking at a CRM system or a platform, you want to look across the whole organization. So you're going to have a lot of people poking at, at the software. Okay, so um, then you need to start to prioritize things. Um, we're getting up on the end of our time, so I'm going to have to move through a little bit of this quickly. But um, you want to have a, a rating system that is uh, not too onerous um, and uh, that is equitable. And what I mean by equitable is you see our rating system, one of the ones we use is something is critical, high, medium, or low. Well, guess what? Not everything gets to be critical. <laughs> so, uh, you know, maybe uh, if you have uh, 100 items on your list, only 10 get to be critical. You know, and then another 10 get to be high. But you don't get to, say, uh, send back your worksheets or your scoring and say, oh, everything's critical. So you have to start to prioritize and, and kind of have a forcing mechanism for that. Um, and, and again, as you work on these uh, ratings and, and lists and things, try not to lose track of the big picture and the big goals um, and the fact that it's serving the whole organization. Okay, so then you go out. Then, now you're ready to go out and start looking at software. Of course, you've probably cheated already and, and, and started to look at some things. And maybe you've cheated by, by going through this webinar series, and it would be very hard for me to say that was a bad idea, so I can't say that. But uh, now you're formally ready to go and start looking at the CRM landscape. So this is a great start, I think. I'm biased, of course, but don't cast too wide a net. Don't do too many systems, too many cycles of looking at products. You just, just exhaust people. Um, you know, frankly, 90% of, of enterprise nonprofits go with one of the vendors that's part of this series. That's why they were invited to this series. If you're going to go outside of that group, and I'm not saying, you know, we don't get paid by these vendors and we don't have any reason to tell you stick with these, um, but if you're going to go outside of these, you probably want to ask yourself, are we really that different from all of our peers and this is the pool that they've been fishing in? Um, and what would it mean if you went outside of kind of what are the normally accepted uh, and adopted products and platforms? You know, what will it mean in terms of, of uh, you know, you having peers who you can bounce things off of, finding talent who, who know those systems, et cetera. Okay, so when you're working with vendors, um, vendors know, uh, you know, they, when you're talking about how their systems work, uh, trust but verify. Uh, set up test environments, uh, get references, but then talk to people who use the system who aren't on their formal reference list, go into user communities, and demos, um, they're very important, but we like to structure them as targeted walkthroughs rather than multi-day demos where they show you every nook and cranny to everybody on your selection team. That will really it will just crush your teams. Um, and with sales, it's important to understand, and you can ask your vendor partner directly, you know, what are your quotas? And what, you know, when do you, uh, you know, do you need to sell by the end of the month, by the end of the quarter, by the end of the year? You know, uh, of course, these are great folks who work at these vendors, but also they're earning a living, and it's good to really understand what's driving them professionally so that you can uh, understand how their uh, interests align or don't with your own. All right, and finally, considering hiring a consultant, I'm biased. I think this is a big decision. I think uh, uh, those of us who do this kind of consulting, we've been through it many, many, many times. Um, uh, but that value is in that process and engaging with vendors and helping you through this, not in suggesting options to you. I've just suggested the options I'm going to suggest that you look at. And it's not in putting together lists with the thousands and thousands of rows of potential uh, op, uh, you know, business needs. Uh, uh, it's really that ability to gauge with you around your strategies and tie those out uh, to your business needs and kind of shepherd the process. So, so where, what do you do next? So my suggestion is that, first of all, you would start by articulating a CRM vision. Uh, why are we going through this process? Um, uh, who, how is it going to significantly and positively impact our organization? Start to really frame that out and tie it out to your strategic goals. We suggest that as the first part of what we call a CRM roadmap. Um, you see on the left uh, a list of the uh, table of contents of what one of these looks like. Uh, not everybody has all these pieces, but uh, it, it uh, uh, gives kind of a flavor of this. And we have a, another webinar series around CRM roadmap, so I'd 
encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and the reason to do a CRM roadmap is it really starts to crystallize that CRM vision um, and it starts to socialize the idea of changing technology, uh, not just uh, you know, as a strategy, but throughout your organization. And it also results in a practical plan on how to get it done. And finally, I just note, you know, visually, for those who like visuals, CRM Roadmap helps you go from an environment, envision how you go from an environment with a lot of different systems to something that will just be more manageable over time and get you into a place where technology is a lot simpler and more streamlined. So with that, uh, last thing I'd leave you with is uh, please do take a look at our CRM papers. Uh, you'll find them online. You'll find them in the handout section of the uh, webinar tools here. Um, talk to others who are doing, uh, doing something similar. And, and if, you, uh, if this was helpful today, we encourage you to contact us. So uh, with that, I'd invite you to um, join us on uh, Tuesday the 27th for the uh, Nonprofit Success Pack uh, webinar. And there'll be more information on the other dates uh, in the series uh, forthcoming shortly. So appreciate uh, all of your attendance today. Thank you.